Okay, good morning everybody. It's not really morning, it's it's halfway to noon for me. Welcome to Chatting Between Takes. Oh my God, I am so nervous right now. I've never been nervous doing a podcast like this before. So, if you have been following along and you're subscribed, you know that Chatting Between Takes uh, is a show that I did Quite literally, I stopped doing it four years ago. Um, I did 50 episodes of it, and then about a year ago, just before COVID, I did uh, five or six episodes of what I called a special drop called Conversations with My Father. So, why did I stop doing this, and what's going on right now? So this is Chatting Between Takes, season two, and I'm calling it, colon, I might be wrong. So, why I might be wrong, what's the deal? The deal is this, in four years off of the podcast, a lot has changed, right? I mean, a lot has changed. It's not 2016, 2017 anymore. Um, And I think fundamentally what's happened is that an entrenchment that had begun has continued so much that nobody will parenthetically consider, hey, here's my opinion, but I might be wrong. So I'm gonna tell you straight up, everything I say in this podcast could be utter bullshit. It probably is, it probably is. I believe it, I'm honest. Uh, If if you listened in the past, you know that I only relate what I believe to be true, and I'll never lie about anything. I might say I'd rather not talk about that, Um, which to me is very different from lying. That's actually setting a bit of a boundary. Um, So what happened was, I was doing this podcast, 50 episodes, yeah, you know coffee's a part of the deal. And um, by the way, I'm nervous because I've never done the video version. I figured why not throw this up on YouTube as well. So I've got the headset going. I start every episode with a clap to sync it. This was the mic I used to record my car casts on. And then this GoPro is a whole new thing for me. Uh, I'm really excited to try out GoPro for the, for the podcast. I've gotten really into mountain biking. I just wanna make more video. I'm moving more towards directing um, in my head. Uh, so we'll talk about that a bit as we go. Uh, but anyways, uh, four years ago, I remember I was driving and I think I was west of Toronto and I was doing one of the car casts because uh, I'll be doing interviews as well as uh, these rambly uh, casts of my own. And I always felt the ones I did in the car were the loosest. Sitting at my living room table with a condenser mic and I don't know, it always felt a bit formal and that's not really how I like to chat. Um, and I'm doing the podcast And it was the run up to the 2016 US presidential election. And it was just another podcast where I was ranting about how fucking stupid uh, Donald Trump was and how stupid the voters for him were. Now let me be clear. Uh, I do have specific politics that will emerge, but I don't identify as anything. I just don't uh, because you'd have to ask me on what issue. But the thing for me that always got me is the fact that the guy could lie and get away with it. I don't want to go down a whole Trump thing, but he would stiff workers and then somehow workers would be like, that's my guy. So I kept talking about this and I got bored of my own voice. I got bored of the loop. So I'm wondering for you people out there watching, do you ever get the, 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 the thing where you are being truthful or accurate to yourself But whatever the medium is through which you're uh, speaking, it creates a narrow sense of that truth. What I mean is this, I'm way more political on Twitter than I am on Instagram. Uh, I'm way more, hey, uh, who's got a stove for sale or uh, knows the best computer to buy on Facebook? Um, And on Instagram, I'm like, hey, check me out. My life's perfect and I'm hot. Um, which isn't true, but it is curated. It's not true that that's what I try and present, but I do present a curated aspect of myself, of course. I post photos where I think I look great. I don't post photos where I think I look like shit. Unless it's funny, and then you're like, oh, it's okay, I look like shit, I'm funny. So it's still curated. So what I was finding through the podcast is it was getting weirdly political, even though that's true for me, but such a sliver. And because this is all for fun and for free, I could just go, you know what? I'm gonna come back in a month. And then I'm like, oh, a month later, I'm like, I'm gonna come back in a month. And I started a few episodes and I could never quite see it through because I just went, wah, wah, wah. This is boring, Uh, I'm done with it. And uh, I'm not afraid of a boring podcast. I mean, for me, the joy of a podcast is just listening, just hanging, just being part of the chat. Uh, This is called Chatting Between Takes, by the way. Because as many of you know, and the reason many of you are here is because I'm an actor, 
And there's something that happens with us actors where I, I've relayed this story before and this is a totally true story. On day two of a shoot, I'm in another country and the lead actor just walks up and he's like, oh fuck man. I'm like, what's going on buddy? <laughs> you look a little rough. He's like, yeah, I cheated on my wife last night and thinking about leaving her and the kids and I, anyways, whoo. And there's nothing weird to me about that. They're just, I mean, it's like, yeah, well, we're, we're here, we're shooting. We're gonna be best friends on camera for the next month or six months or whatever the shoot is. Let's just get at it. And what I've tended to do is move that into my friendships as well. I was chatting with a friend uh, through Instagram DMs the other night. And she was like, I really appreciate that we can just cut to the bone. Like, you just get to what's going on. And if I was 25, I would be doing this as a manipulative thing. Like, I can get people to open up, especially chicks. Hoo, hoo, hoo. And it's like, now I just do it because I need to do it. Um, because it's something that if I don't do it, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to just talk about the weather. I talk about the weather in relation to whatever outdoor activity I want to do. Um, how's everyone doing during COVID, by the way? Like, how's everyone faring? Um, I'm out for a drive right now, by the way, which technically we're in a lockdown and who knows if that's something I should be doing, but uh, I have to get my dad some supplies and groceries. So I'm on my way to see my dad um, and I figured I'd just take the long way which will probably be what I'm doing before I head to France next Friday to go shoot a flick. I eat. Um, do I have to TM um, Ali G every time I do that? Just know that uh, nothing I do is original. Everything is stolen. COVID for me has, um, Jesus, I was just gonna say COVID's been wonderful. How, how weird is that? Why did I hesitate? Because I never wanted to gay that there is a shared experience here and while my experience is valid to me the shared experience i don't think can be negated uh and that covid's been shitty so why would i say it's been wonderful and why does it matter the shared experience let's start there just because i've never experienced racism or been overtly racist it would be fucking ludicrous for me as I hope we all know. If you're listening to this, if you're watching this, we're probably a bit aligned, right? I mean, you're probably not tuning into this and going, what? He uh, accepts that science supports that uh, gender and sex aren't binary? That's crazy. Like, you know I think that if you're here. By the way, that's true. The whole uh, sex is science crowd, they're wrong. They don't fucking understand science. I have a biochem degree. Yes, I dropped that like uh, an arrogant elitist because A, I'm an arrogant elitist, and B, because the number of people who pretend to believe in science when they want to justify bigotry, misogyny, uh, transphobia, etc., it's mind boggling. Where are you when it comes to client science? You fucks. Um, so if I've lost any listeners or viewers at this point, uh, we're probably down to the core that we want to move through the bottleneck of uh, what we'll call the future. Being progressive is just about looking to what's gonna be better. Like, what will we wish we did in 10 years, right? Like, what's the right way? What's gonna help the most people so that in 10 years we're better? Um, I don't think about progressive as being using the right term, but if the right term ends up making everyone feel better, then we have a better society in 10 years. So it's progressive, we're progressing. Uh, it ain't rocket science. So yeah, we have to acknowledge shared experience that a lot of people have had a really bad time during this and that's why I want to not say it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful for me. I spent the morning listening to Led Zeppelin albums, albums I bought in the 80s that I just put on the hi-fi while I was getting ready to come out today um, and just drank coffee and listened to, I haven't listened to vinyl start to finish since I don't know how long. I mean, my last girlfriend and I, we had a house with a record player, but the number of times we'd just sit and listen to a record was, was rare. We'd put it on and do other stuff. I'm talking actively listening start to finish to records. That's been a COVID thing for me. Um, you know, I'm very good with my money, and so I'd saved money in a way that I had money for a nice stereo, and I bought a nice mountain bike, and uh, again, if I, I you know, I, I'm really... Uh, I hang out on Twitter a lot, I hang out on Facebook a lot, and I understand that there's people who think that uh, 
talking about such things as gauche or shitty, but I don't know, I'm 45. I've been active in my career for 20 years. Uh, I'd hope I'd be able to buy a mountain bike. I don't even have kids that I know of. If you're out there, hit me up. But only if you're like over 15 and aren't asking for money. I, I, we, I can help you out a bit, but what I mean is, don't come crying and shitting all through my living room, infant. You know what I'm saying? Um, anyways, I've talked about this on an old podcast. What would be better than just some like really cool 14 year old showing up and being like, hey, like, hello? And they're like, uh, you're my dad. I'd be like, what? And they're like, yeah, that remember back? And I'd be like, oh shit, yeah, that did happen. Uh, well, what's going on? And they're like, I don't know. I'm just like doing this, doing that. I'd be like, Dude, you're cool, like come on in here. And also like, keep me cool. Like what What am I doing wrong? Apparently the crying uh, emoji that I dine out on, you know, the like I'm laughing so hard I'm crying. Apparently that is now cringe. Uh, does this matter? Why do I care? Oh, for fuck's sakes. Um, uh, I do get asked a lot in the DMs uh, from fans if I'm single. No, I'm not. And I say that because what was wonderful about COVID is my wonderful partner, Anais, she moved in. And uh, that was incredible. Before that and during that, I was living with a fella named Andrew. Great guy. Great guy. We'd have long chats. We have a lot in common. Um, and then I mentioned the mountain bike. My brother and I got to go mountain biking in the Don Valley. Totally healthy, never in violation of any protocols. You're 15, 30. Okay, this is gonna be a thing. Dear GoPro, I bought your suction mount that's supposed to be able to go on the outside of a vehicle at 150 miles per hour. That's what the ad says. And you will neither stick to my dash nor my windscreen um, for more than 20 minutes. This is uh, this is effed up. I'm gonna figure this out. So, hold on. Let me pull over. Let me put this up. This is how uh, this is how fun. F1 chatting between takes season two. I might be wrong. GoPro, you might be wrong. This might not actually latch at 150 miles an hour. But you know what? If you fall again, you fall again. C'est la vie. Um, I don't remember what I was just talking about. I got distracted. It doesn't matter. You know, I mentioned that thing about uh, staying cool. Hey, 14-year-old kid who shows up at my door uh, and is my uh, son or daughter or whatever you want to call yourself. Um, hey, uh, keep me relevant. And I'm kind of not kidding about that. So I went, I was Googling myself last night. Yes, I do this. Yes, every actor you know does this. Um, and uh, I was Googling myself and I saw a video that shouldn't have been up, by the way. It was um, from two years ago. It was a Vimeo link to a Star Trek Discovery audition I did. I say it shouldn't be up because that stuff's supposed to be private so fans don't get storylines early. So if anyone had Googled me two years ago, you could have seen a storyline. Uh, I haven't been watching the show for a while uh, since season one. Um, if you know me, you know why, you know, you know why I haven't been tuning in, is what it is. Mm. Anyways, the point is, is that I, um, see this video myself last night from two years ago. I was living in LA at the time. I was there for six months and I'm looking at this video and first off, I feel like I look way younger than I do right now, which I'll get to because I did look younger. Secondly, it felt like yesterday. I was like, what? Like if you asked me when I got back from LA, I'd say, I don't know, that was like uh, three months ago. No, dude, that was two years ago you were there, which is so, I don't know how time works for you people, but time for me is so bizarre because like I don't have a, uh, a regular job. And again, I don't have kids. Uh, but time just like there's things that happened to me eight years ago that feel like yesterday and I can't tell you what I had for breakfast not every day by the way and also my memory for facts and figures uh, is, is excellent now part of the reason I think my memory isn't as linear as it used to be is because I used to be so hyper vigilant about everything that went on around me 
Um, which by the way, if anybody's in a little 12-step program known as Al-Anon for people who grew up in households or have been in relationships with people who are alcoholic, um, you'll understand what I'm talking about. There's a hypervigilance where sort of safety and also a sense of sanity can come from clocking, no, that's the truth, here's the truth, here's the truth. Because when you're engaged uh, in a relationship, either parental to child or uh, you know, lover or best friend or whatever it could be, sibling, um, with somebody who's behaving crazily and are full flight from reality, what can end up happening is that I needed to cling to what I perceived truth to be. There's a reason I loved math, because I was surrounded by a swirl of insanity uh, a lot of the time, most nights. Um, truth wasn't a thing. So, I then become hypervigilant about, no, this happened, no, this happened. And here's the thing, it doesn't mean I'm, it's like I said, I'll always be honest, it doesn't mean I'll be right, I might be wrong. Well, I was probably wrong about a lot of what I perceived and thought, but I wasn't wrong to do it because it was a safety mechanism that got me through tough times. So as I have gotten into a healthy place, i.e. Uh, self-love, self-parenting, a place where I don't need to be hypervigilant because I don't hang around people who make me feel unsafe, um, well then what happens is that vulnerability gives me space gives me space to breathe and just be. Whew. See, now's when I like aging. Gives me space to breathe and be. And in that space, I don't need to catalog everything you said or did because I don't fear you. And I don't fear my own insanity through yours. And that's the beautiful part too, is through breathing, being, I get to be an independent agent as opposed to an extension of you. A lot of people who end up uh, dating or, or, or growing up in that type of household, they end up um, having the appurtenance of a narcissism, but it's actually like, if you're okay, then we're okay. Uh, and so it becomes this thing where you become an extension of me and then I try and control you, but it's actually coming from a healthy place, which is, I need to be okay. So now that I don't feel that way, I don't have those relationships and I have space to breathe and be, um, I don't remember a lot. I don't remember a lot of stuff. Um, so then what happens is time becomes like, you look at a photo and you're like, oh yeah. And it feels like it's happening. This is also, I think, partly because I'm an actor. And I don't say, oh, I'm, you know, I, I, just so you know, the way I act is I imagine things until my body believes they're true. It's not rocket science. It takes practice. It's a craft. It takes real work. And some people are innately gifted at it. Some people like me, yeah, I have a talent for some stuff, but I really had to work at that aspect of it, of making my body believe things that weren't happening by imagining them. Other people work at it different ways through memory, through different things, but this is the one that my body responds to. So when I imagine things, it's like they're happening. So when I look at a video of myself two years ago, I hear my buddy Gunner's voice. I can hear my voice echoing off, uh, you know, the concrete kind of swank Patty has. I can see the lights reflected in my own eyes and remember, not remember, I'm quite literally there in my imagination seeing the lights reflected back at me. And I do believe that's part of the reason why my mind goes, what? This is happening right now. What do you mean this was two years ago? Now, I'm not saying this is a plus or a minus. This is just my experience. And so what happens is then when I'm confronted with the fact that I don't look the same as that guy, I've already got more gray and wrinkles. And when I said that I have aged since then, you know, I was always very honest on the podcast what was going on in my life and what's gone on in my life in four years has been incredibly positive aggregate, but included my mom passing away and an eight year relationship ending. Uh, and so that was something that I shit you not aged me. Like I woke up one day and uh, I was just grayer. I, was, I just had wrinkles, I was tired. Uh, I was sad every day for a long, long, long time. I still wake up with just random sadness that I didn't used to have. Um, and definitely when, you know, uh, your partner and you split up months after a mom dying, it's, it's, it's two pretty primary females walking out the door. So there's a lot of that. I had to rebuild trust with myself and etc. It was a whole freaking journey. 
And uh, anyways, you, you, you can't see this if you're listening, but I'm pointing to the old grays that showed up. And there weren't as many of those. Because <laughs> that video I'm talking about with the Star Trek audition happened like just after that year. Anyways, I'm rambling about that, but time and me get really um, confused. And the other reason I was thinking about this is that somehow the older I get, the more I care about like childlike social media. You know, I, I realized someone blocked me on social the other day. Now, I remember stating to, to an old partner that I feel like I'm not speaking with an authentic voice. I feel like everybody just kind of likes me, but I'm not saying anything. Because what happened when I got sober 13 years ago, gave up all forms of booze and drugs and uh, mind altering stuff, I was really pulpy. I'd been such a wank in my life, uh, but I was living fully, no. You know, if you're an addict, you know what I mean, like no, but yes. And so what happens is I realize that this way of living is dreadful, that I'm hurting myself and those around me, and I, I, we change it. I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot. But what happens is, is that I um, have no personality for a while. I just don't. Now, one thing I've learned is that when you don't have a personality, people overlay what they want onto you. So if you're just standing there at a party, people just be like, hey, I really like that guy. A, I need to take a note from this because I overdo it. I still overdo it. I have a vitality that's both awesome and a double-edged sword of, hey dude, sit down, shut up. Nobody gives a fuck. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of true, right? Like nobody cares. Um, but I fear they won't care, so I keep talking. Hence, a podcast that's gonna go about an hour of me driving in the car sharing thoughts. Um, that said, we all get why podcasts are enjoyable because eh, we're sharing along. We're taking the ride. I'm quite literally taking a drive right now, heading south on the 427, about to grab the gardener. You probably, if, if you're if you're uh, nutsly following along and you live in Toronto, not nutsly, maybe it's how your mind works. Uh, if your mind works this way, you might be like, oh, I know exactly where he is. To those of you watching on the YouTube, um, so I had no personality. I had fully become pulpy, and then people overlaid, wow, that's a good guy. Um, and I say this not trying to stir up controversy or shitty, but, you know, I'm early 30s. I still had a buck or two in the bank. I'm sort of like white and leading man enough that I'm inoffensive to like nobody. Like everybody's like, oh yeah. Now then what happens is I start almost as I wished speaking with my voice. I start to find my voice. I start to make art. I start to have opinions that I believe in. And because I'd gone from, you know, in my 20s, there was no social media world to a social media world, I'm putting those opinions out to a lot of people I don't know. So what's the point of all this is that, look, there's some people who've blocked me, some ex-girlfriends, um, who else? There's one person who's blocked me who's, uh, it's the bizarrest fucking thing, but I won't even go down the road. It's like, okay, you got some drama, honey. Um, but then there's some people you're like, I've never met them. They're a friend of a friend. I was gonna go follow them because they're super talented on a thing. Wait, what? That's a block. Very bizarre. And I won't tell you how I know. I have another account that I never ended up using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Googled myself and I have a burner account. I told you, I'm not cool. Come on, come on. We all know what I'm talking about if we know what I'm talking about and if we don't, who cares? Um, so I have become highly sensitive to this. I can lose sleep over this. I don't know when this happened. I don't know when this happened. I will go train karate to the point where my forearms, my shins, my my nose is banged up and bruised and I got cuts under my eye. I'll go do jiu-jitsu being choked out by the most badass motherfuckers on the continent and trying to do the same, vice versa, working through injury, pain, lack of breath, and I'll just walk away being like, toughen up, motherfuckers. Everybody in this world needs to toughen up. And then I'll be sitting there quivering internally because someone I've never met has blocked me on social media. True story. 
is what it is, my friends. And it's it's interesting because in high school, and I've talked about this, and if you've listened, you know this is uh, this is true. Like, you know, I was pretty popular grade, I don't know, whatever through grade eight, grade nine, just kind of finding my feet. And then, interestingly, hey, maybe there's a theme here. I start finding my voice. I start getting into classical rock and guitar in a way that I want to grow my hair like Robert Plant on the back of Led Zeppelin III. I'm loving the ballet that I started in grade six and uh, carried on all the way into my 20s and that's why I'm an actor and some of you hear from tiny pretty things, like that's all true. But what happens is when you're a very in touch with his feelings, somewhat feminine looking, I hate that term. Can we please normalize femininity, period, let alone for straight men? This has come up a lot too. I know I get asked this, I know someone asked this in the DMs when I asked if there were any questions today. I don't identify. My behavior has been 99.9% .9 straight. I've made out with dudes, I've made out with transgender people. I'll just leave it at that. But in high school, but let's normalize who gives a fuck. Long hair, dances ballet, moves what people would call faggly or gracefully. I don't care how you want to phrase it. Uh, that was complicated for people I was in high school with in Guelph. Wasn't complicated for me. Um, when I talked about that household being a bit bizarre and growing up with some stuff that made me need to feel safe, I'll tell you where I never needed to feel safe. That other version of my sense of self where my parents just supported what I did. When you're born in the 20s, Irish father, you show him your long hair and your earrings and he goes, oh, that looks lovely. You're supported at home when you wanna go into the arts. And they're like, oh great, how can we help? You're supported at home. You know, I didn't have to deal with any of that. So my foundation felt safe. So then I go to school and I'm 14 and all these wankers are coming at me, like literally, like wanting to be violent or calling me a fag every day. And my point is, is that I just fucking, I didn't double down or not, I just stayed me. And in staying me, I was just kinda like whatever. But the point all this is that, not just whatever by the way, ended up having a very wonderful turn of events through all that as people grew up and I ended up uh, feeling very much a member of that high school in a very popular and, and happy way. And I have very fond memories, like 99.9%. Um, even the being picked on, I've talked about this, I think I repeat these podcasts a lot even though it's been four years, I don't think it was bad for me to be picked on. I want everyone in this world to feel safe, but you won't, like you won't, like come on. Come on, you won't, right? Like it can't happen. Like I want you to, but it can't happen. So let's hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Like I want you to, but it can't happen. So getting tough, getting some grit. I will never be, I do teach karate and whatever, but I'm not gonna be the guy who fake grits you. But the idea that you gotta get tough because the world is tough. You know, we have a saying, it's not even a karate saying. Times are tough, be tougher. Um, I believe in that. I don't wanna have to be tougher. I wish I could just be a little goo goo gaga baby that gets my belly tickled and smiles at the world and the world smiles back at all times. That'd be sweet. It ain't it though. So, uh, so I go through that bit of a gauntlet, you could call it. Why am I talking about all this? Because at no point do I remember consciously really caring that people were picking on me. I would have liked to have been popular in retrospect, but the people who were picking on me by virtue of picking on me were assholes, so I wasn't gonna give up who I was for an asshole. But that wasn't a conscious thing. That was an immediate guttural response to, wow, you just told on yourself, so now I'm good not caring about you, right? Um, I have trouble doing that today. And I, I, I trace it back to getting sober. I did open myself up to a way of being and a vulnerability and a pulpiness that includes, please love me, please love me. I want everybody to love me, but I also need to be authentic. So what happens is by being authentic, not everyone's gonna love me. I, I can never go back to that pulpy first six months of sobriety, not knowing or caring what I think. It could happen, but I don't plan on relapsing today that I know of. And uh, so at that point, it's like, okay, you, you, you have some footing, you have some wisdom, you have some grounding, you don't know it all, you don't know much, but you do know what you know, right? Like, I don't know much, but I know what I know. I might be wrong. Ew, oh God, that was sweet. That's like, 
That was like a freestyle. Like we brought that right back to But I Might Be Wrong. Mmm, drop a wiggity, wiggity. Whack. Uh, yeah, the coffee's kicking in. Woo! Uh, I am working on a film with an incredible person named Karen Knox, who goes by Knox. And she, uh, she wrote into the script, the coffee's kicking in, woo! Into the mouth of a character who isn't me, but has certain things that came from me, and never have I felt more seen. Noxy, you Roxy, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, this is the podcast, folks. I might be wrong, season two. Uh, so I asked on uh, on on Insta. I should post this stuff earlier. I only got a few responses because I posted about 12 minutes before starting the podcast. Uh, does anybody have any questions for the podcast? And one that came in is, when are you coming to London? I believe it was a fella named Paul. Paul, I can't fucking wait to come to London. Are you kidding me? <sighs> I love traveling. I love traveling. I love traveling. Um, yeah. The idea of just being for pleasure able to do that. So I'm going to France next Friday to shoot a film. It's a French film with Alexandre Lamy. I'm so excited to do this, like beyond excited. And uh, I can't talk much more about it because you know, that's how these things go. Um, but the idea of getting on a plane, I have to quarantine in France for seven days. I believe there's a curfew there. When I get back, I have to quarantine for two weeks in my own home, create a little granny suite. Seriously, and I'm gonna because I believe in all of this. Um, so, uh, wait, you're gonna go shoot four days, five days on a film, but it's gonna take a month of your life? Well, yeah. What else am I gonna do? It's COVID, baby. I know there's other things shooting, but right now, the idea of going and doing this is more exciting to me than let's say shooting a Frankie Drake. I've already shot a Frankie Drake, that's why I can use it as an example. Um, because this is an adventure and I'm gonna be safe as fuck, but it's also, you know. Now, why am I saying all this, Paul? Because I can't do what I would normally do. What I would normally do, my girlfriend's from France, is we would take time off. She'd either join me the week after shooting or the week before, depending on her schedule. We'd travel around, visit her family, go to the south. She'd show me the parts of France that aren't Paris um, or Normandy, because those are the only two I know. And then it'd be like she'd fly home because she has a job. Uh, she's a civilian. And then uh, I'd pop over to like London and visit Daniela, Norman, Danny from Tiny Pretty Things. And Maybe go visit some Irish cousins. Like, this is what my normal life would look like. So when am I doing this, Paul? You tell me, my friend. You tell me. Uh, ask the vaccine makers, the governments. Uh, I don't want to be shitty about this, but boy, are the governments fucking this stuff up. Boy, are they bad at this. Like, wow. Again, whatever your fucking politics, the one thing is that there was no federal coronavirus plan for vaccinating, period. I get that the US has a states rights thing that we don't quite have in Canada, I get that. I get that's part of your thing and I would never suggest it shouldn't be, but you do have a federal government and you do have a federal national pandemic and there was zero plan. It's not that it was a bad plan. It's not, oh, right wing, left wing. It's like, there was no plan. Like, this is who the guy was. Motherfucker, literally golfing while there was no plan. So why did I just get political? Cause I do. But also because um, it's why we can't travel yet. Because they're really bad at this. Now I'm not saying, oh, scientists and government save me, but yes I am. Duh, of course I am. Please. There's people whose whole job is to figure out how this stuff works and then they do. By the way, do yourself a favor. Look up an mRNA vaccine versus other vaccines. It's not like, I will take this thing the second it comes out. It does not get into your DNA. mRNA does not work that way. I mentioned I have a biochem degree. Now let me stop joking about being elitist. What that means is I can read every single paper and understand what they're talking about. Now what I can't totally do is know if it's a good or bad thing always, if that makes sense. They're describing how the stuff works and I go, that all makes sense and that does not get into your DNA. And 
But then what I do is I go look, uh, somebody who, uh, who's awesome, who I really dig, she sent me a video of a guy talking about all the reasons why the vaccine's bad. And I believe he's a biochemist. And I listened and I'm like, okay, I understand every word he's saying. Let me look into this. You know, a smart guy says some stuff and you're like, well, I guess I shouldn't take this thing. And then you realize that everything he's published since this thing showed up has either been discredited, he's retracted, etc. Now, not everybody has the luxury of being able to, um, luxury, I work for the degree, but you understand what I'm saying, uh, to be able to read and interpret everything. So we do rely on people to interpret for us. Oh, damn it. Now we're talking Catholic versus Protestant. Does the priest tell me what the Bible says or do I read the Bible? Oh, I'm not religious, by the way, that I know of. So the point is, is that now I'm in a situation where uh, I need to rely on somebody. And who am I relying on? Who am I relying on? Where am I getting this source from? Ooh, I don't even know. I'm not, I'm not gonna crack this open on this podcast, but there, my friends, is the source of all evil. Who's getting rich off you getting the bad info? Just ask yourself that. You know, uh, I remember once being in a car forum with a bunch of right-wingers, and they were all claiming that Big Enviro was lying to us about everything because of all the money they get. And I was like, do you understand that all the funding that's ever gone into all greenness is what a single oil company makes every quarter? But for these guys, no, it was big Enviro. It was big green, was manipulating everything. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's a really, I mean, there is money and there are grants and there's always like somebody who's gonna be like, man, if I can get this grant, I can cheat the system. That's inherent in humanity. But the idea that big green is coming for you, okay. Literally one of the Koch brothers admitted that they wish they hadn't disinformation so hard. I believe they retracted it a few weeks later, like went right back into the disinfo, but yeah. Anyways, always look up the think tanks who are talking about this shit, because 99% of all think tanks are uh, right-wing organizations who reverse engineer opinions by paying scientists who are discredited already in their field. I'm not kidding with that, by the way. Um, man, just got off topic on that. So Paul, I can't wait till there's a vaccine. I can't wait till I can travel like that. And I can't wait to come to London. Uh, the next question I got from Val was, can I talk about my March project? Absolutely. It's been announced now and I got publicity photos that I'm gonna start dropping. Uh, to be honest, a lot of them contain vibe of the film, so I'll drop those a little, little closer to the shoot. I shot this with Stephanie March, who's, I mean, I say this a lot, right? I'm a very positive person, but one of my favorite people I've ever shot with. Not just one of my favorite actors, because she's so talented, but yeah, just sitting chatting between takes with her, chatting between takes quite literally. Uh, pure delight. Shamim Sharif was the director, Lifetime Film, shot this in Winnipeg in October, and it's called House on Fire, which is a very high concept title. I used to think high concept meant like hoity-toity concept, like advanced concept, until someone enlightened me that high concept just means that the title tells you everything you need to know, uh, like snakes on a plane. It's neither a good nor bad thing. Sometimes high concept's the best. This is high concept, house on fire. So uh, a woman named Deborah Green in the 90s, true story by the way, it's a, it's a book called Bitter Harvest by an author named Anne Rule. Anyways, um, this woman basically started undergoing uh, postpartum, borderline, I, I don't, I don't have the exact diagnosis at my, my hands and I don't want to uh, disparage any type of mental health diagnoses, but she ended up become, it manifested through alcoholism, pill addictions, and then she ended up burning down her house, not once, but twice. The first one's a little vague. And then, uh, I'm not gonna give away what happened. It's out there, you can look it up. And then I am her husband who is, uh, yeah, we both work as doctors, blah, blah, blah. I could go on and on. The shoot was incredible. The project's gonna be great. I haven't seen much of the footage. Uh, I've done some voice recording for it the way we have to. We have to do additional voice recording after the fact um, because there's bumps and different things while we're recording. The same way I've got two mics going here. Uh, in case one of them gets bumpy or, or whatever, there's an option. So we do that after the fact and the footage looks amazing. Shamim Sharif, love this woman. Oh. You know, the one thing I've noticed, and I've talked about this again, the older and chiller I get, the more beautiful the world gets. 
Like when I was in, when I was 25 working on my first TV series, I was never an overt diva or asshole. I, I wasn't, but I was frustrated at the world. And part of it was that I was looking to be saved, right? Um, you know, Alison Feltis, if you're listening, I've, I've gotten to have wonderful connection with her since that show, but I was sort of resistant to all the wonderful notes and opportunities she would give me and other people at the network. And part of it was that I was let down by the fact that the sheer act of booking this show didn't save me from myself. But I didn't know at the time that I was craving this, right? I. I so I did end up turning to booze and drugs in a way that felt like it was saving me for a while. And to be honest, it did. It opened up aspects of myself that needed to be opened up. I just wasn't able to close that door when I needed to. Anyways, the point is, is that, again, never overtly a jerk or anything, but just had an internal resistance to saying, yes, let's try it your way. Partly through uh, needing to be saved and feeling let down I wasn't, and partly through fear that I wouldn't be able to execute what was being asked of me. These days, I don't have that fear. If I'm on set and you're like, hey man, can you come in and rage off the top and then break down and cry? I'm like, yeah, no problem. Let's try it. I don't evaluate it when you ask me to do it. I just try it. If it's no good, it won't be used. Nobody edits bad shit into a movie on purpose. And uh, if I can't do it, then who cares? I can't do it. The director, will the producers will go, mm, that ain't it. And it'll be like, yeah, it didn't quite work, did it? And they'll be like, no, I think you were right on your first instinct, which is often A, true, and B, a way to be like, yeah, my idea and your execution of it didn't match. That's fine. I have no ego about that anymore. Um, be, yeah, so what happens is, that's kind of how I try and move through life a bit. You know, if someone comes up and starts talking to me, my job is to be motiveless. My job is to be helpful. My job is to have that conversation for fun and for free, even if it's someone I'm doing business with. I have a script read through of a thing I'm directing and uh, I've got two actors who are, who are helping out because me and Knox are gonna be playing in it, but we can't see ourselves. And so uh, two incredible actors uh, are willing to read our parts so that we can watch. So they get nothing out of this, right? They get to act for a bit on a script that they don't get to do the roles. So God bless them. They're coming for fun and for free and for service. So what if I start getting intense and weird and needing things from them? So, you know, when they're like, how do you want us to come ready for the read through on Sunday? My answer is however you want, whatever you bring will be informative. Whatever you bring will be helpful. And uh, again, the more I can embrace this, and I embrace this through knowing the other way doesn't work. When I try and have it go my way, it doesn't work. So what I do is try and take it as it comes and then see where that fits into my goals. And even again, with people where I want things, if I'm calling a producer and saying, hey man, I need your help, I'm trying to make a movie, would you be willing to read the script and, and see if it's something you're interested in? There's no motive there, I'm just literally asking. I had to learn how to do that and not just try and be friendly, uh, fuck that. I think some people can operate through um, what I'd call uh, manipulation or motive. I wish I could. I mean, look, again, going back to DJT, this guy manipulated his way into the presidency, right? Good for him, like independent of politics. That guy was able to function purely off like a narcissistic uh, fear meets, like where's those uh, Mexican immigrant caravans? Those El Salvador, they're gone. We haven't heard about Hunter Biden's laptop since the day of the election. Those are all just bullshit fear mechanisms that make you think China and immigrants are coming for you with no evidence and they disappear the second the thing the guy wants happens or doesn't. So, you know, some people can highly functionally, whatever you think of the dude, highly functional, whatever you think. Uh, you could argue all the ways that's not true, but are you president? Okay, well that guy's shit worked. Uh, I'm just trying to get a movie made and sometimes it does and doesn't work. But anytime I approach with motive, Sean's mechanism gets so ugly that he, people can spot him a mile a fucking way. A mile away. Somebody was asking me about this with dating. Uh, I think it was actually a dear friend and I were chatting about someone she was dating who was a bit needy. It's not my story to tell, but I, 
what I kind of shared was that, yeah, like personally, I'm so detached for a couple weeks. And then when it seems like something good is happening, I get needy as fuck for a couple months, maybe, maybe a bit less. Cause that's the fear of loss stage. And in that fear of loss stage, I start to behave with motive because when I'm on fear, I'm now trying to control the outcome and that's what motive is. So at that point, all the authenticity that was appealing and attractive goes away. Person starts to question their own choice in me, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it gets navigated, sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, I've had a lot of wonderful relationships and had a lot that could have been wonderful, not really go beyond that stage which is good for the person who walked away, or even me who was like, oh, this doesn't feel good, because something about there was missing for it to keep flourishing. But what happens is, let's say two, three months later, if we're dating and you're like, hey, I need to go away for a month to a cabin and just do my thing, I don't get jealous or weird or this or that. I've been in open uh, poly, open type relationships where you know, you feel a little twinge because it's a newer vibe, but, uh, but the jealousy isn't quite the same if, the thing's solid, right? If you're jealous of your partner, the thing might not be solid. But what I'm getting at is that at that point, I don't have a motive. My motive, because I'm over the hurdle of fear of loss, is that you feel safe, loved, supported to grow and flourish as yourself within this relationship. That's how I try and be with my friendships too. Um, so, and that's why even, you know, I, I'm not really a poly open guy, but I get it. Like, eh, whatever, the sex act for you, uh, you want to involve other people, it can be pretty fun and sexy for a while. Um, it isn't once that fundamental thing for me goes away, but if that thing's there, who cares what my partner wants to do? So it's not an agenda though I push either. Um, but anyways, fear of loss for me there creates motive and motive is ugly. And when I'm ugly, people walk away and I don't mean visually. Uh, it's almost worse when you're not ugly visually. I don't mean I'm generally gorgeous. I mean, you show up looking good, you get the hair done, you're ready to go, and then your tentacles down below are going, hey, love me, hey, I'm afraid you're gonna leave, hey. And uh, yeah, that is not a pretty place for us to be, my friends. It really isn't. Uh, I don't know, do you go there? Do you go there, my friends? I, I do. That goes back to the idea of caring who blocks me on Insta, like, come on, wow. I'm not gonna list all the reasons my life's wonderful, but there's nothing wrong in my life. Like, there's nothing wrong in my life. There's nothing that's really fucked in my life. Not everything goes the way I want it to, but there's nothing wrong. And I will find things that are wrong. My ego will, that's for sure because my ego is not my friend. My ego does not care about me. Um, one other thing is some people who DM me say, you know, the, 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 the I, I see your DMs. Not all of them, I'm sure I miss some. Some days I get a lot, the private, uh, like the, the, what are they called, message requests. Um, and you know, with every, you know, being on the boys, being on the tiny pretty things, like even the Kept Woman movie I did, some of these were pretty popular and I love that. I love you for it. I love having fans, it's a really beautiful thing but I don't always engage. And uh, I think that's important to say, is that I'm just being honest, I, I, I won't always engage. I see most, maybe even all the messages, I wouldn't know if I missed one, uh, but I choose not to engage. And that's me protecting my own energy, my own vibe. I put a lot out and then uh, I've become a bit more of an introvert as I get older. And uh, yeah, and I'm the same. Look, I'm a fan of this game. There's people who uh, I'll see on a show and I'll message them like, oh, that was amazing or whatever. and. You know, every once in a while they'll be like, oh dude, love your work too. But more often than not, um, I won't hear a response and I'm good with it because I'm really just saying, hey, great job, this and that. Um, and again, kind of like I'm talking about with that fear of loss, as soon as I start to over-engage, well, that can get weird. Um, or not. But there was a great episode of uh, Facts of Life where Tootie goes to see, I think it was the Jackson 5, I don't think it was just Michael. And she like brings a cake, but then as she's going in, the fans freak out and then security rips the cake apart. And then she ends up getting in the room, chilling with, I think the Jackson 5. I saw this when I was like two. Um, the point is, is they say, 
Well, remember, the word fan comes from fanatic. And my thing is as much as I want to be a fanatic because I'm basically a needy person, I try and remember that and go, oh yeah, just send a message or two, not, not, don't worry too much if they respond. Uh, anyways, I'm just throwing that out there because uh, I love the engagement with the fans and uh, yeah, I don't always respond. And, uh, and to be honest, I won't and, and I'm okay with it and I hope you are too. Uh, for me, I really want to put the energy into having a wonderful life away from the entertainment type stuff I do so that then, A, I got shit to talk about or bring through the character, uh, but also, like I said, I'm becoming a little more of an introvert as I get older. And uh, I was talking with my dear friend Kobe, Kobe Ryan McLaughlin, the other day about how I used to just wake up. I'm thinking about like 2003, 2004 in LA, especially I was there alone. The addiction wasn't full blown, but it was showing up. I was single, so I was dating a lot. And uh, you know, if, if if you and I dated, then you know what I'm talking about. Like before your eyes were open, there was loud music cranking. Hey baby, I got a coffee, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that music was going loud until the end of the, the night. Like there was no downtime. Because I didn't understand what downtime was. Now on one hand, A, I was imbibing uh, and using stimulants, but B, I was fucking 25 or 26, you know, you do have a, a limitless energy there. Now I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm not trying to, I'm not out there trying to um, have sex with random people, and I'm not out there trying to scrounge up cocaine, and I'm not out there trying to blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, last night I sat and read a book with the vinyl going lady went to bed I went down and watched some halt and catch fire really enjoying that show uh, kind of a sleeper didn't didn't know about this show and then uh, and then I don't know it's like five or six years old wonderful performances yeah really cool cool sort of 80s computer vibe uh, like the, the formation of tech um, really really fun anyways I watched an episode of that did some stretching blah 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 um, that's a great night for me now. If that sounds lame as fuck, c'est la vie. I wish I had more of those. By the way, I've talked about this again. Maybe not on the podcast. If I could go back to that 26-year-old self in LA, I'd be like, dude, have fun with all this. You're young, dumb, full of cum. Just, uh, just also accept the lonely nights. Be, oh, you want to be a Zen master? You want to be a badass? Go get paid, go get laid, but also sit home alone and feel the feels. Because as long as you avoid those, you will not be okay, big picture. Goes back to the idea of, do I like that I scrounge around on my Insta for bullshit? Nope. But if it's true, I gotta be good with it. I, I don't have to love it, but I gotta sit with it. I got to allow that to be part of the integrated whole of who I am. And that's something I was unwilling to do back in that day. Now, I didn't know I was unwilling to do it. So I wasn't willfully avoiding something. I just wasn't allowing it to happen. Uh, I'm going to pull over here. Let me just check something here. All right, a question from you, Laws. I think the question would be a subject you know about that you were sure that most people know more about than most people you know. Like, oh, a strange and specific fascination. What's a strange and specific fascination I have? Holy shit, you know what it is? I don't know if this is quite what you're asking. It's people's response to basically anything. Like, this sounds a bit cheesy because I am an actor and it's a cheesy thing actors say, but I am astounded by the human condition. I am astounded that people will fall for a con man. I am astounded that in Ontario politics, people would vote for Doug Ford. Like that astounds me. The fact that they'll vote for him, we've seen this for thousands of years. People will choose a leader that doesn't, isn't good for them, doesn't suit them. But watching it happen in real time and watching their responses. So for example, on Twitter, I don't really care about tweets as much as the comments to the tweets because that tells me the aggregate of who's out there and what they're thinking. And while I think people don't behave truly authentically when they're anonymous, oh, my camera just died. Okay, well, if you're listening, you're getting a little extra. Um, 
I think that the uh, anonymity lets people exaggerate who they are in certain respects, but at the same time, it lets them say some stuff they're really thinking. So there's a there's a plus and minus toward the authenticity of that. But anyways, I don't know if that's a really great answer, but I think I think it's it. Like, I'm hyper, hyper interested in who says what to what to what to what. And, you know, hey, y- y- you'll get this, I think. I mean, going back to where I kind of started this podcast talking about, I once had a therapist say I'm a lot like Cassandra in Greek times who's sort of... Um, problem and frustration is that she can see everything that's happening but can't express it in a way that every anyone will listen to and when you grow up with parents fighting and drinking and some constant confusion and you're sitting there going wait here's where you misunderstood them and if you would say this because that's what they were actually asking then this would all you know and this is stuff I'm clocking at age five now that at that time was frustrating because who who's listening to the five-year-old when they're in the middle of a drunken fight? But as an adult, I don't need anyone to listen because I've accepted they won't. And I just get to still enjoy that skill. Anyways, I love that question. Um, everybody, I'm signing off. I lost my camera. The GoPro lasted about 50 minutes. Um, there we go. New toy, new learning, chatting between takes, season two. I might be wrong. Episode one. I love you all. Stay safe. Thanks for joining and I look forward to the next one.